Well, I think I'd say we can, we've reached critical mass and not too much traffic. Hey, hi friends. So um, I'm gonna officially start this evening program. Uh, welcome to the November 2020 evening program of the North Coast chapter of the California Native Plant Society. Our chapter is one of 35 that cover the whole state, full of people who are um, helping do science, education, conservation, and horticulture for the sake of native plants. So we're a big group and there's a lot of talent all over the state. Um, I'm Carol Ralph, currently our president, and I'll introduce a few people who I know are here. I can't see all the people at once, but um, Andrea Taylor, who's probably in your upper left corner, is our vice president, as well as our all important Zoom master at the moment. Anita Gilbride Reed is our treasurer, she's here. Um, Karen Issa, who who's our salesperson, t shirts and posters, and a few other things, she's here. Um, Greg O'Connell is one of our rare plant co-chairs. So we have a lot of people helping make a lot of good things happen in this chapter. And right now, let's have Andrea with her Zoom master hat tell us any procedures we need to know for watching this program and participating. Um, so we will do our traditional, um, any plant observations. If you'd like to share those. Um, you can put your observation in the chat and I can read them to everyone. And then um, screen sharing capabilities are on, but please don't use them. Only um, Carol or Joseph should use the screen sharing capability. And um, hold your questions at the end after his presentation, we can call on you and um, you can show your face and ask your question or I can read it, whatever you're more comfortable with. So is there a way for a person to raise his hand to be called on? Um, you can send me a message in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. There's a, a chat and I can call on you that way. Okay. I'll read that. So right now I'm going to ask the audience a question and they have to click the chat to answer. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I want to ask the audience, are there any veterans here tonight who we can thank? Anything coming through? Not yet. No. Okay. Well, if they're not here, it's hard to thank them, but we are thankful. Um, Okay, so uh, next I'm gonna try something new. Uh, those of you who come to our meetings know we have a yes, I would like list and it uh, has, has ways that you can get involved with our chapter. So tonight I'm gonna try sharing this yes, I would like list with my screen share. Here we go. It's, Andrea, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So, I guess we're not doing that. Um, Are you changing anything? I'm clicking around, yeah. Oh, now, now I've got it. Okay. Right. There. Yes, I would like, okay? So um, you have to have a pencil or paper or copy paste or something to get the contacts to do these things. But if you want to be notified of our future chapter events, and sometimes I send other people's events if they're closely related. And if you write to me or call me, I will um, invite you through our Yahoo group to get those announcements. And then if you would like to help at our nursery, propagating and taking care of native plants that we're raising for sale, then you contact this email address. And that goes to our nursery manager, Chris 
Beresford or our assistant nursery manager, Barbara Reisman, and they'll tell you what the schedule is. We currently work at the nurseries, at the nursery Wednesdays, 10 to one, but we're gonna try to add a regular weekend work day too. Then if you are a native plant gardener and uh, want some advice about what native plants to plant in your yard, you can call our consultation service and that's Melanie Johnson with her numbers there. And if there's anything else you think we should be doing and you'd like to help make happen, then you contact me and we'll talk about it. And here at the bottom is our all important website where you can go and uh, find out what's coming up. You probably all went there to find your way to this Zoom meeting. Okay. How do I unshare? Um, it, you should have a stop screen share button. Ah, got it. Hey, how about that? If we have to do this for a real long time, I might learn some other Zoom tricks. Okay, now let's hear, does anybody have any good plant observations they'd like to share? While everybody's finding their chat button, I'll say that on our field trip to Big Lagoon on Saturday, it was great to see this sphagnum, but actually the plant I thought was, that I enjoyed the most was over in the sand near the boat ramp at Big Lagoon. And that, that was um, a broom rape that was there growing on the gum plant. We were looking at the gum plant, which is a very low growing prostrate one. And <clears throat> Janet Stock had alerted me that she's seen broom rape there. And so when I saw this, this little um, dried brown thing sticking out of the ground with a bunch of little brown dried flowers on it right by the uh, gum plant, I knew that was it. It's a parasite on the root. And so it has no chlorophyll. Most of the plant is underground. It only puts up the flower stalk. So it's like a mushroom that way. But in this case, it's a parasite on the roots. And we used to call it Orobanchi as the genus, but now we have to call it Aphilon as the genus. And this was Californica. Has anybody raised their hand yet? No, I don't see anything in the chat. So um, I could share a plant that I learned on the field trip this weekend. Um, Joseph showed us the native Hypericum. I'd only seen the invasive Klamath weed, but I got to see in the bog the tinker weed, the Hypericum anagalodes. Yeah, cute little plant. Anybody else? Okay, I do have plants, yeah. Um, not sure, I think it's Eli Callison. Good. Saw a closed bottle gentian in Missouri. Huh. So there are lots of gentians there. And they're blooming in November. Great. Okay, well, I think we better move on. So, um, unless Karen and Isa can remember anything I'm supposed to announce, We'll move on and have Greg O'Connell introduce our speaker for tonight. Hi, thanks. Can uh, can you hear me, Carol? Yes. Great. My I name can is Greg see O'Connell. Great. Um, so it's my it's my privilege to introduce Joseph Saylor tonight um, uh, before he gives his talk. I met Joseph uh, probably about five years ago, maybe a little more, and we we uh, we worked together on a an eelgrass survey in Humboldt Bay. That was a lot of fun, uh, very cool uh, to be out in the middle of Humboldt Bay and with such a unique plant. And so I I think that's the first time that I one of the first times I met him. And yeah, we've worked closely over the last several years on a bunch of different projects and gotten to know him um, pretty well uh, over the last bunch of years. 
So I'm very uh, honored to introduce him. Uh, Joseph uh, has his roots in Siskiyou County. He grew up uh, on the Klamath River uh, in the Happy Camp area. And growing up, he's had, he said he's always had a love for conifers. And that's one of the things that really got him going and interested in botany. And, um, and he loved to draw them and, uh, and also teach his siblings about trees and plants as well. So he's, he's got a, a botany blood from an early age and a, and a teacher at heart in, in some ways as well. Uh, Joseph got his botany degree from Humboldt State University in 2013 and uh, went back to uh, school after a little while to pursue a master's degree, which he just wrapped up uh, this year. And his thesis project was uh, the study that you're about to hear in Big Lagoon Bog. Um, he's currently working as a botanist and wetland ecologist at SHN Engineers and Geologists. He lives here locally um, in the Humboldt Bay area with, uh, with his family. Uh, and he has a young child, as, as do I. So we've got a lot of parallels in our world these days. Um, let's see here. I asked, I asked a, uh, Joseph a question earlier today and about uh, if he had any advice for aspiring botanists. And he said, don't give up that, um, and to be persistent and, you know, um, that's a good that's a good lesson whether you're taking hard classes in college or you're just trying to learn things on your own or you're trying to get a job uh, in the in the field and so persistence pays uh, so that's that's a fun thing that uh, Joseph shared with me earlier today and um, and also it's exciting to this is a real kind of transition point for this project that had had early roots with uh, Dr. Walker Dennis Walker a retired botany professor from Humboldt State that kind of raised concerns about a need for habitat management at this fen, and a local botanist, Dave Emperor, originally wrote a, a restoration plan um, maybe six years ago or so. And Joseph really helped carry uh, this project forward, and it became his in a lot of ways. So, um, with uh, without any more delay, uh, please welcome Joseph. Thank you, Greg. Really appreciate it. Share my screen here. Can you guys see that? Can everybody see this? I just need one response. Yep, looks yes. good. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you everybody for coming this evening. Uh, the title of my talk is The Effects of Woody Vegetation Encroachment and Removal Within a Coastal Fen. And if you guys didn't guess, this is Big Lagoon Bog. This is looking south. Uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, wetlands. Wetlands are important. They uh, provide a lot of habitat and a lot of uh, function that's required for this, this planet to work. It's capturing and infiltrating stormwater, recharging aquifers, uh, also providing habitat for a lot of species, and they vary widely. We'll be talking about a very specific type of wetland in a little bit, but it's just good to know that wetlands are important. Uh, However, in the last 200 years or so, the global uh, loss of wetlands has been about 50%. In California, that's been a whole lot more. Uh, it's lost about 90% of the wetland area in the last 150 years. Uh, this is a result of conversion to agriculture or uh, development, other uses. Um, the consequence to this is a lot of this habitat we were talking about earlier has been lost. Um, so in response to that, uh, a lot of people have recognized that this, this was happening at an alarming rate and wetland areas were set aside for preservation. This was a really good thing. Um, however, it, what's been happening uh, probably in the last 30 years or so, there's been a lot of attention um, drawn to the fact that a lot of the wetland habitat that was set aside is being lost or degraded because of a lack or a removal of natural disturbance regimes. And within wetlands, disturbance is needed. It's important. Uh, people don't generally like to see things getting impacted, but you think of a wetland system, with, if it's a, near a river or whatnot, it's gonna have floods moving through. Um, if it's up in mountain areas, you might have fires burn through. Um, in other areas, uh, that would have been grazed or are still grazed, which keeps a lot of that thatch and litter from accumulating. But in these protected areas, which are generally 
uh, either have extremely valuable habitat or near populated areas, uh, these disturbance regimes are altered or cease altogether. Um, and what we're seeing is woody vegetation encroachment. And this is a direct result of the secession of grazing and disturbance and other things that would remove this woody vegetation. Um, the problem with this is these woody species compete with herbaceous species and a lot of the these wetland areas. And what happens is this these woody species um, lead to drier conditions within these wetlands. Uh, that's increased transpiration rates. You have increased litter deposition, uh, soil stabilization, and these things dry these wetlands out. And what we see in these locations that are becoming encroached upon by woody vegetation is a loss of herbaceous species diversity. And for those of you who have been to Big Lagoon Bog, you recognize that a lot of the um, diversity within the fen is presented by herbaceous species. So that brings me to my next point here. A Big Lagoon Bog, not a bog at all, it's actually a fen. And a fen, I think, is a word we're maybe uncomfortable with here in the United States. It's used a lot in other portions of the world, but fens are very, uh, they're more common than bogs in our areas. They're not common here, but it's important to know what the difference is between these two. So fens, you have water flowing in and water flowing out, such as the case at Big Lagoon Bog. Um, what this does is it creates a more neutral pH, and this allows for uh, more uh, species diversity. You also have that stream depositing uh, minerals, sediment, and you have um, in addition to bog, bogs also have peatlands, but fens are a type of peatland where you have this exchange of ions and it creates higher species diversity. Um, what it also does is it allows for woody vegetation to encroach because you have these changes, um, you have higher, uh, let's see, growth potential than bogs. Bogs are extremely acidic, which is not the case at Big Lagoon Bog and bogs don't have water moving out of the area. That creates some of that acidity. So it's important to know the difference. I know that it's called Big Lagoon Bog, but it just, it's a false name. So really a fen. A um, little bit more on fens. They're uncommon in California, mostly because of our Mediterranean climate. Um, fens require that the soil is saturated year round. That allows that peat to develop. Um, because they're uncommon and because they reflect habitat that occurs in more northerly areas, they, off, they act as refugia for rare or uncommon species. Um, fens are also, um, they're separated in the landscape. You don't see a fen and then another fen and another fen like you do in the north. You may have a fen here and then, you know, 20 miles away you have another one. Um, so you get some very unique assemblages of vegetation that occur within these fens. And this is the case at Big Lagoon Bog. And this brings me to our study site. Uh, Big Lagoon Bog, as some of you may know, is a fen located on the coast here in California, just north of here. Uh, just wanna show you a little bit if you can see my screen. This is the fen here, Pacific Ocean here. This is Big Lagoon itself. And then we have 101 here. So you can see how it's it's closely, um, but immediately adjacent to Big Lagoon itself. The stream that I was referencing that's transporting water through the fen and maintaining that summer moisture originates in the hills here, flows through the fen and into Big Lagoon. Uh, this also contributes some of the sediment and um, summer moisture like I mentioned earlier. Uh, one other thing to note is that the water level within Big Lagoon affects the water level within the fen. And we will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so just a few pictures of the area. For those of you who haven't been there, I encourage you to go, really neat spot. Uh, spent many an hour up there as we will go into in a little bit here as well. But this is looking south. This is pre-treatment. Um, you can see we're in the herbaceous dominated portion of the fen. And if you can see here, if you can see my mouse, this is kind of the edge of the extremely encroached portions of the fen. 
but you can see it's also becoming encroached from the west here and from the east. So we're kind of getting pinched off into a last remaining herbaceous dominated area. And you can see there's actually islands of woody vegetation in the middle. Uh, just another view from that same location, but this is looking north, different day, you can see the sun's come out. Um, and we can see the same phenomena going here. This is actually the road that was created across the fen for the campground. And there's woody vegetation encroaching from that location. And then again, from the sides. We don't actually see much woody vegetation in the center here, but there's a few species here. Um, so just a little bit more so you can understand this fen because it's, it's so cool and this location um, and what's going on here is critical to understanding uh, the history of the fen. Um, so Big Lagoon itself, that's this body of water here. It's actually loaded, located in a, in a syncline fault. So this area here is sinking. Um, and uh, this area was submerged you know, thousands of years ago when the ocean levels rose. So the fen itself, it, it's not you know, multiple thousands of years old. It's important to understand this because there was a study done by Gordon Lepic and they were thinking that initially the vegetation assemblage there was relictual from previous ice ages or whatever and these species were left there. But what it turns, it turns out that it's more likely that these species were random introductions. Um, you know, some say some waterfowl were flying over from the north, they landed here and they deposited some seeds. The importance behind this, as we'll talk about a little bit, is that these the species assemblage here is very unique. And when it's lost, it's very hard to um, get it back because these are really random introductions. Uh, one other thing is this is the sandbar that's established across the mouth of the lagoon. This, um, what is it? It becomes built up during the, the summer months. And then in the winter months, as the stream here fills up Big Lagoon, it will uh, breach through this location here. What's important about that is as the water level rises within Big Lagoon, it'll rise within the fen. And we can actually see a pretty close correlation to the winter water levels within Big Lagoon and the uh, area where the woody vegetation encroachment kind of uh, is less intense. Uh, so historically, what would have kept this woody vegetation from moving in? Why is it all of a sudden becoming a problem? And again, this is important to understand because we're looking at something that is um, occurring that's going to result in the loss of these special status species. Um, so what happened historically that kept this from uh, woody vegetation coming in? So one is cultural burning, wildfire, uh, natural grazing, browsing. These would have occurred um, for hundreds of years. We don't know how long that was going on, but we know for certain that it was happening. I would love, love, love to see these guys back in there, but they haven't crossed over 101 um, in many years. I don't think they know that it's been cleared out and that there's habitat for them there, but uh, I would love to see them out there. They would, they would browse a lot of those woody species down. Um, so fast forward a little bit. The surrounding forest was logged, um, and this is in the 1880s or so, and believe it or not, they grew potatoes in that sandy soil around the fen. So you can imagine the impacts that this had on the area, maybe introduction of sediment, who knows, um, but it is well documented that they were grazing the fen and kind of doing less intensive agriculture into the 1930s. Uh, that all stopped with the construction of vacation homes in the surrounding area. And it was about that time, which is late 1930s, that the woody vegetation encroachment began. Uh, this is based on historical imagery, which I'll show you in just a second, and also on uh, tree rings that I counted as I did my research. It wasn't included in the thesis itself, but I was very interested to see the edge of the, the age of the woody vegetation. And they were all about 70 to 90 years old. Uh, so it looks pretty well correlated. Um, and then one other thing to note is that tsunamis from, it, from earthquakes likely reset or significantly disturb this area. Um, the last one was 300 years ago, and I don't know, um, I wasn't allowed to do any soil boring or soil disturbance of any kind, so I can't say exactly how that would have looked and how things would have changed here. 
but it's something to note when thinking about the vegetation assemblage. So here's a uh, photo from 1947. This is you know approximately 10 years after the cessation of grazing. You can see here the vacation homes, they've been constructed. And then this line here is about the level of the winter high water mark. Um, and you can see even then the woody vegetation uh, was non-existent where these areas that were getting flooded yearly. Um, you can see that there's no woody vegetation along the edges of the fen here, but you can see that that encroachment is beginning to take hold in the southern portion of the fen. Important to note. Um, so this is what it looks like on the ground. The woody vegetation encroachment is, or was, uh, pretty intense. It was 100% cover in large portions of the fen, approximately 60%. And uh, what you see in the understory was little to no herbaceous species, and we'll talk more about that. Um, so I want to transition a little bit into some of the, the cool plants that are out there. These happen to be the special status species, but 11 have been recorded from out here. And how this relates with the uh, woody vegetation encroachment is I did not observe a single special status species when in areas that had woody vegetation encroachment. So we can see they're very sensitive to this, uh, this new phenomenon here within Big Lagoon Bog. So we had 11 special status species recorded here. They were all um, within the early successional habitat and within um, Jepson Manual and other uh, floras, they're recorded as requiring early successional habitat. It's estimated that about 60% of this habitat's been lost from within Big Lagoon Bog. And it should be noted that this isn't isolated to Big Lagoon Bog. This kind of woody vegetation encroachment is occurring up and down the Pacific Northwest along the coast. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But just want to point out some of these really neat species. This is the bog club moss. Um, it's a list 2B.2 species. It's got its little strobe eye here. Um, this is very common in the north, but it, its nearest neighbor is about 250 miles away. So this, this is a very isolated population. And within Big Lagoon Bog itself, there used to be three occurrences, three population occurrences throughout the fen. And there's now just one population occurrence. And this was the largest individual within that population. So it's probably the most imperiled species within Big Lagoon Bog at this point in time. Uh, Northern bugleweed, list 4.3 species, very common in the uh, early successional portions of the fen. Uh, we have a number of species here, uh, like we were talking about earlier. There's about six species shown in this picture, three of which are special status. So we have the sphagnum, which is uh, uncommon. There are other occurrences in the North Coast, but they're, they're disparate and they're not, um, they're not next to one another. Um, we also have the round leaf sundew. That's this guy right here. It's also uncommon. There are only a few recorded occurrences within Humboldt County, and some of those don't exist anymore. And then we have the marsh violet. This is a list 2B.2 species. Now, it should be noted that there has been some debate on to the, as to the uh, identity of this species. It's been, uh, let's just say Viola McCluskey or the uh, McCluskey's violet has been recorded from out in the fen, but from my um, work looking at this species, it looks like Palustris or the marsh violet is what we're looking at primarily within Big Lagoon Bog. Uh, we have a couple of other uh, more common species, the arrow grass here. Uh, we have the star, um, star fruited sedge here. And then there's one other species, which I can't see. There's six in here. I can't remember what the last one is, but it's in there somewhere. Um, four of the other special set of species that have been seen. This is a little green sedge, list 2B.3. Uh, the marsh pea, uh, this one's also uh, associated with the early successional habitat, but right on the edge of the encroaching vegetation. It likes to creep up into that encroaching veg. Buxbaum sedge, this has got to be my favorite um, sedge. Um, it's just really cool with that blue-green color. And then we have the bristlestock sedge, which was not observed pre-treatment. 
but one of the successes from this year's monitoring, which we'll touch on in a little bit here, was the re we found this species again, and it hasn't been seen since 2012. And we found it in an area that had been 100% uh, cover with woody vegetation. So just, I'm, I'm not gonna go into all the details of these studies because we could talk about statistics and I could show you a bunch of graphs and it would be all fun and good, but I just wanna give you the, the meat of it and the results of it. But basically this study was divided into two separate questions. As you can see here, the first was, how does the woody vegetation encroachment impact the herbaceous vegetation within the fen undergoing large scale encroachment? Basically, that's all to say is, is removing the woody vegetation even a viable option? What's going on out here? Should we remove the vegetation? So that was the first question. The second was, how do the herbaceous species and the woody species, was specifically looking at the special status species and the non-natives, respond to a woody vegetation removal treatment? We'll talk a little bit about both of these studies. So the first was titled Woody Vegetation Encroachment, a Driver of Herbaceous Species Diversity Loss in a Coastal Fen. And again, this was to investigate the impacts of woody vegetation encroachment on herbaceous species richness and cover. So just looking at how does the woody species impact our herbaceous species richness. And I documented all the species out there and I recorded cover by non-living components. So there was, there was a lot going on in this study. I'm not gonna go into those details, but if you want them, I can give them to you. And if you guys wanna ask questions about that, please do. Um, so just a little bit on the method. I placed transects 12 meters apart, 25 total transects. Um, length of each transect varied, but I will say that that equaled 338 plots as I put my plots four meters apart. Um, so there was a lot of data collected out there and I wanted it in a grid pattern so that we could get nuanced changes in vegetation as it relates to the woody vegetation encroachment. Just to give you a little picture, this is what some of those transects look like. It was a lot of work, a um, lot of machete work, and then I'd have to move my plots over, you know, offset them about a meter or so, so it wasn't in the impacted vegetation. But getting through this woody mass was a lot of work. So here's some of the results. Um, you can see here, I need to move this panel. Okay. Um, you can see here, uh, this is a heat map of the herbaceous species richness. And again, perfect correlation, our herbaceous species richness was highest in the open early successional areas. And you can see we had less than two species in the areas that had high woody vegetation cover. Um, sorry here, just, okay. Uh, the woody species percent cover, so this you can picture these are the areas that are encroached, where you had 100% cover by woody vegetation, it looked like this. We had basically, you know, very little herbaceous species diversity. So you have an inverse relationship or a direct relationship, however you want to look at it, between the uh, increasing woody vegetation cover equals decreasing herbaceous species richness. That held true pretty much throughout the fen. Um, similarly, wanted to look at how um, the special status species were operating out there. And special status species density was highest in these areas with your highest herbaceous percent cover. Um, it was pretty much directly related. As you can see, these areas with 100% herbaceous species cover, you have pretty high special status species density. So these areas, such as here with you know, maybe six special status species, looks like this. So there's woody vegetation all around. So you can see reflected in these low or zero species. That's these areas here. The higher density was right in the middle in these open portions. Similarly, you can see where there's little to no herbaceous percent cover right here. This is where you have your high woody vegetation cover. And that's kind of the, the gist of the, the study was we found that when you have increasing woody cover, we lose the herbaceous species richness. 
Um, so just a little bit on who's who's the big invaders out here. These are all native woody species. They're wonderful species. Most of these I've planted in my native plant garden at my house because I think they're amazing. Uh, except for maybe the California black and sick spruce. I didn't plant those. They're still amazing. Sick spruce, about 20% cover out there over the whole fen. It was present in I think about 50% of my plots, little saplings to big, um, big trees like this, you know, 10, 15 meters tall. Uh, we also have uh, California blackberry. This was the most common species, but it actually had very little cover. So I found this in over 60% of my plots, but it had 3% cover total within the fence. So yes, it's invading, but it doesn't actually have a high impact. That's how I looked at that. Um, California wax myrtle, very common out there, uh, about 10% cover, and it was one of the one of the main players for the woody, woody invaders. Uh, Western Labrador tea, beautiful species, but also about 8% of the woody species cover was provided by this species. And then lastly, Douglas spirea, a little bit less, about 5%, but this species is single-handedly invading the early successional habitat in the northern portion of the fen and is actually pretty alarming at how it's invading those areas. So it needs to be watched. Then uh, dominant herbaceous species, believe it or not, reflecting the woody species encroachment. We have two species that really like shaded woody encroached areas. So the deer fern, most common species that we found out there for herbaceous species. And then skunk cabbage, a lot of cover, a lot of cover by skunk cabbage, which interestingly, will when we did the treatment, this species was knocked back quite a bit. And then our third most dominant herbaceous species was the Pacific reed grass, which is a one of the keystone species of the early successional habitat. Um, so conclusions, you know, if this woody vegetation encroachment continues, we're going to lose that herbaceous species diversity. It's going to continue to decline. Uh, another takeaway is that the special status species are especially susceptible to encroachment probably be the first species to be lost, or at least within the first. As you saw in that heat map I showed you earlier, special set of species that are most correlated with areas that have the high herbaceous species cover. Um, also, as I touched on earlier, these processes are occurring at numerous other coastal fens in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm hoping that this study can be used to estimate diversity thresholds in those fens. Um, this is not an isolated issue. There's a number of people who have been studying this, this phenomena up and down the Pacific Northwest, and it is a problem. Um, furthermore, if we have woody vegetation being a primary or at least strongly correlated with a reduction in herbaceous species richness, the study suggests that woody vegetation removal can be a viable restoration technique within Big Lagoon Bog and other fens that are being impacted. So that leads into the second study. Um, this is the initial response of vegetation to a restoration treatment within a Northern California fen, Big Lagoon Bog. Um, so what we did was, and as Greg mentioned earlier, a lot of work was put into developing this treatment plan, but essentially we removed all these woody species and we wanted to see, my portion of the study was to investigate how did woody species, herbaceous species, special status species, non-native species respond to this treatment. Um, and I definitely wanted to give particular attention to special status species and our non-natives, which could jeopardize the success of this treatment. Uh, a little bit of background on the removal treatment. Uh, we removed everything, uh, all woody vegetation under 30 centimeters. Um, so it was so much vegetation that it took a team of 17 workers five weeks to remove this vegetation. And we're talking an area uh, less than five acres. So it's incredibly dense woody vegetation. It just shows how productive these uh, fens are. Um, we avoided special status species. And then also important to note is that the cut woody debris was carried out of the fence. So we didn't drag anything, all of it was carried. Um, something important to, uh, think about on this as well though, is a lot of that litter, as you can see in this photo, was not removed and remained. So we weren't mimicking a fire or one of these more natural disturbance regimes. 
but at least the, the woody vegetation was removed. Um, so results, here's a before and after picture from one of the middle transects, is transect 10. And this is looking south. So you can see that before these, these woody species were about two meters tall. I was actually standing up on some branches to get this photo over the top. And now we have a, an area that does have a lot of open, open ground, a lot of litter down in here, but you can see a lot of herbaceous species responding to this treatment. Now, granted, some of these are woody species that are growing back, but fairly good response, um, just at least visually. We'll talk a little bit more about that in depth. So species richness increased on average about 1.7 species per, per meter plot, and that's how I measured these things, meter by meter plot. Um, this represented a 37% increase in herbaceous species richness. What I didn't note on this slide is that I did another analysis just recently because I was curious um, and removed the non-native species from this, this analysis. And we still saw an increase in native species richness by about 1.4 species per plot. So again, some of that was non-native species, herbaceous species responding to the treatment. Um, we saw special status species cover remain unchanged, so we didn't see like aggressive growth by these special status species, but we saw occurrences increase by 43%. Uh, this was primar primarily driven by sphagnum, which I saw little sphagnum starts all over in the area that we had treated that had formerly been 100% woody vegetation cover. Um, so that was incre incredible to see because the sphagnum is arguably a keystone species here in this peatland fen. Um, however, must note the bad news here, um, non-native species cover increased by 2.36%. That indicates a little bit more aggressive than our special status species. And then the occurrences increased by 71%. So we see a dramatic response to the treatment. It should be noted um, that the number of plots that it was initially occurring in, non-native species that is, was much less than our special status species, but still we see that that is responding. Uh, these were the primary culprits. Um, Himalaya blackberry, we pulled a number of these out after taking the data. I made notes of that because that, that, that will impact how we do our monitoring in the future. Hey, look how successful it was. Well, actually we pulled a lot of it out, but I can't just stand there and watch this species become dominant. So pulled a lot of that out. Um, hairy cat's ear has responded pretty aggressively out there. This might be more of a transitory species. It, it established itself really early on and then slowly as more native species come in like the Pacific reed grass, it, it will likely diminish. That's, that's what we're gonna monitor for. Um, pampas grass was responding pretty well to the treatment. Again, volunteers pulled out a large number of pampas grass um, seedlings from the fence. So hopefully we nipped that in the bud. We'll keep looking at that monitoring plan. Broad fruit spike rush. This is an interesting non-native species. It is strongly associated with the early successional habitat. And it's going to be interesting to see how that impacts the special status species because it's occupying the same habitat. Same with the heath grass. This is a Scotland native. It also grows in fens up there. And it's also in the early successional habitat. And we didn't see these two species impacted by the treatment, but we do see them expanding in the early successional habitat. So that's a little concerning because that's where our special status species are. So conclusions, uh, we need disturbance. It's necessary to maintain these early successional habitats. But as you can see with those non-native species, it's not without its risks. Um, just a rehash, a special status species, they responded well to the treatment, but with the invasive species or non-native species rather, exhibited even greater increases. So what do we need to do about that? Well, we can't see restoration as we did our job, we're done, okay, we're out. We have to see that we have to come back. It's not a one-time effort. We need to continue to treat um, the area while those native species are becoming established because we've removed natural disturbance regimes for you know, 70, 80 years, we can't expect that one-time treatment is gonna 
fix all the problems. We also have to recognize that we're dealing with, with uh, non-native species. They're here and they're here to stay. So we have to be very diligent or at least aware that these species are going to become established. We need to be aware that this is gonna be a problem. Um, so we need continued treatment and monitoring to maintain these early successional habitat and address these problems as they arise. So to do that, we didn't just stop there. Um, I developed a monitoring plan for the SEN uh, because CNPS has graciously accepted to do the monitoring for the next couple of years. So uh, annual monitoring is gonna be done for four additional years. We just did one of them, 2020. So we're gonna be monitoring up to 2023. Um, there is additional treatment planned for next year that's 2021, and then another follow-up treatment in 2023. And this monitoring is gonna document uh, the responses, vegetation of those treatments, but also we're gonna be able to tailor the treatment to what we've been finding in our monitoring. So it's, it's gonna be really important to work those two together. So we continue to document changes in herbaceous species diversity and occurrences. And we're going to record the long-term response. Like I said, some of those non-native species are likely transitory, um, but we really won't know that until we get this data and continue to collect the data in FEN. Um, and again, we're going to use this to make informed decisions about future treatment. And I don't know uh, what your guys' schedules are, but I'll definitely put a plug in. We need volunteers uh, to get out there and do the treatment. A number of us were out there this year, and the monitoring went really well. Here's a little preliminary result. Um, we saw that herbaceous species cover continued to increase along with woody vegetation cover. So not surprisingly, those woody species are not giving up easily. They're coming right back, um, hence the additional treatments. Um, we've seen aggressive woody species growth in that Southern portion of the fen where it was most dense beforehand. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the bristle stock sedge wasn't seen since 2012 but we did find it again, excitingly, in an area that had been completely encroached. So we're seeing that removal working. Um, and then non-native species are continuing to invade. And I mentioned that the Himalayan blackberry and the pampas grass are particularly alarming because they can have huge impacts within this fen. I just wanted to point out this picture here. Um, we see native juncus coming in, a lot of litter still but you can see how we're getting our native vegetation responding in some of these even areas that were completely devoid of any vegetation beforehand. So last but not least, a little bit of regional context. As I said, this is occurring in fens up and down the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I'm, I'm really hoping that this study and the monitoring that CMPS is gonna continue to do is going to help at least build some momentum in getting treatment done in these other fens. Uh, these special status species are already uncommon and they're becoming more uncommon because there's no disturbance occurring within the fens that were set aside, not to mention the ones that have already been lost. Uh, so really want to put a call out there for this, trying to get this study out there to get treatment going into other fens. Uh, or other wetland communities that are becoming encroached upon. Um, Big Lagoon Bog is well known uh, in the local botanical community, and we're hoping to maintain that diversity within Big Lagoon Bog. And with that, I just want to acknowledge a few people who have been really helpful uh, with this project. And you know what? I don't have... Um, I don't have uh, Greg O'Connell on here, and I want to do a special call out to Greg because he really helped get this project going. Uh, same with same with Dave Nimper, who's on my committee, Carrie Byrne, Jeff White. They've been really good at giving feedback during this project. And then Eric Jules has been incredible during the life of this project. And cutting those transects through the vegetation was really hard. So special thanks to my field crew and then uh, statistical modeling, we didn't really talk about, but they helped me with that. And then my wife, Hannah, has been incredibly amazing during this whole time, cutting vegetation, doing analysis and all that. And then lastly, thank you, California Native Plant Society for the help in this project. And with that, 
uh, I say thank you. That's all I have. Just going to go back to the beginning. So I want to open it up for questions, and I'm I can keep sharing my screen. Um, that way, if anybody has questions about a particular slide, we can go back to it. So, Joseph, mm -hmm. um, I see two questions so far. Um, Donna Wild Earth asks, um, how long after the treatment were the results surveyed and tabulated? Okay, um, so we did the treatment in October, which is right before you know winter sets in, and uh, we did the first assessment of the vegetation in July through August, when most of these, these species are uh, most easily identified. So there was a little bit of a, you know, maybe what is that, seven, eight months between the treatment and the first recording. And then the pre-treatment uh, analysis was done in July and August, again, before the treatment, which occurred in October. So pretty close to the treatment. Okay. Um, Steve Wonder, uh, Underwood is asking who owns the property? Oh, good question. Um, so it's actually a county park, believe it or not. So this has been recognized as a botanical hotspot for many years. Um, and the county bought this parcel. There's also a state land, which uh, the, the boundary is a little bit funny, but it's somewhere right in here, right at the edge of the woods. So um, there's public owns this. However, there's private land on this side of them. This is the west side and that's the um, Big Lagoon Bog Corporation, I think. They kind of own the land and they manage it for the vacation rentals up there. Okay, uh, the next question is, regarding the treatment plan, how did you guys land on manual cutting and removal of the woody brush versus something like a controlled burn? And do you think the results would have differed had you burned? Oh, good, good question. Yeah, the we had a lot of pushback from the Big Lagoon Bog Corporation. Uh, understandably, they have their their little vacation homes there, um, so that kind of put a controlled burn out of the question. I think that a controlled burn would have been a wonderful thing here for species diversity. A lot of these uh, herbaceous species would have responded really well to that removal of the litter, removal of built up thatch. Um, the, the thing is, something also to note here is the burning initially probably wouldn't have been a good idea because what was happening here is the establishment of a new stable state. So we've moved from open herbaceous species to woody dominated. And a lot of these species are so large that if we burned it, they wouldn't necessarily die or there would be so much debris left out over that, uh, left over that the fire may not be effective. So what I think would have been, if I had all the money in the world and all the time in the world, I would have done this treatment and then I would have burned it right after doing the treatment. That would have removed all the litter and all that thatch. And I think what would have happened is we would have seen a lot more um, special status species starts, herbaceous species seedlings, um, because that, that bare soil would have been exposed. All right. All right. Um, so Carol Ralph asked, why did you leave the Oregon crab apple um, in the southern portion? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, maybe it's because it's cool, I don't know. But actually the real reason was we wanted to leave some three-dimensional habitat for bird species. A lot of bird species use this area. In fact, I saw a, um, an osprey chasing a bald eagle right out there when I was doing my, this was after treatment, of course, um, really cool. But anyway, the long and the short of it is we wanted to leave three-dimensional habitat within the fen for bird species, just thinking of it holistically for not just our botanical species, which obviously is what I love and what we love here, but for a few of our other furry or feathered friends. Okay. Um, 
Natalia is asking if you'll be needing any volunteers for winter break. Winter break, I, I wish. We really have to stick with the same um, time, the monitoring time. One is because a lot of these species will go dormant during the winter and we'll get like false readings and reduction in cover. So I wish I could say yes, but uh, really the, the time we need volunteers is July, uh, a weekend in July, typically. We got, we got the monitoring done in two days this year. So Taya was asking if you... I didn't catch that. Could you repeat that question? Still there? Yeah, do you... Uh... We're having some trouble, at least I, I don't know if it's just me or if it's it's uh, your computer or what? I can't hear the, couldn't hear that question. Yeah, my internet's um, Can you read the group chat? Yeah, let me, I think I have to, oh wait, here it is. Yeah, let me see. Okay, let's see. Okay. Yes, I can read read the chat. So da -da, got that one. Okay, so from Thea, what do you know about the fire history of this particular area? Cultural and wildfire. Would prescribed burning be an option? It seems like it might be helpful. Yes, it would be helpful. Um, it's not an option right now because of adjacent land ownership. Uh, the fire history of the area is really hard to document, at least in this location, because everything was logged in the 1880s. But we know from the 1880s um, on that there was a wildfire, two wildfires that burned north from Trinidad in the 40s. Um, they weren't huge and they didn't actually reach this location, but they burned within just a few miles south of here. So it does happen. And, uh, Maybe one day we can we can show that um, prescribed burning would be an option. We just need to get the adjacent landowners on board. So impacts of drought years versus wet years on the reestablishment of native herbaceous plants versus invasive. This is a great question. Um, a lot of what happens in a fen is kind of isolated from drought years, which is just awesome, part of an awesome portion of, or awesome component of these habitat types is there's, there's the water within the fen is directly related to the water level within Big Lagoon, which is pretty stable. Even in a drought year, um, Big Lagoon itself is going to maintain its elevation based on the proximity of the Pacific Ocean. So I'm not sure if in this fen there is gonna be much change, but I know that other fens, you have fens in montane areas, you have fens in uh, maybe you know, on the eastern side of the Sierras, whatnot, that would absolutely have, you would see impacts that would change year to year. But in Big Lagoon fog, I'm not sure how much of an impact that would have. Next question was, how was the treatment funded and is it sustainable? So the treatment was actually funded, this is really cool, working together kind of story. And the treatment was funded by Caltrans and it was actually mitigation for a road project they were doing within Big Lagoon watershed. Um, and they, it, unfortunately it's, is it sustainable? Yes, in the sense that it's a roadway project, but no in the sense that this was a one-time funding, but it did fund three different treatments. So we did get the initial treatment, then we have the one next year, and then we have one in 2023. So really neat working together, but we're definitely going to be looking for some way to do this treatment following the um, termination of funding. Uh, let's see. 
What CDFW permits did you apply for and receive for modifying vegetation, initial disturbance for sampling, removal of vegetation? Uh, or were you working under a county routine maintenance agreement? Same question goes for incidental take permits for working with and around CRPR species. Were you not able to get a permit for soil core sampling or what was the hang up there? This is a great question. And I think, I think this would be a question for Greg O'Connell because he was instrumental in the permitting part of it. Um, I know that we were initially going to have to get a coastal development permit, but that we ended up not including the portion of the fen that's in the coastal zone. Um, so, Greg, if you want to chime in on this question, please do. I can say that we were not allowed to do soil sampling because the area is an archaeologically sensitive site. So, no, no soil disturbance in this location. Hey, Joseph. Yeah, that's right here. Um, the, Cal, uh, the permits for this were acquired by Caltrans as part of their 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 highway project. They they included this mitigation uh, uh, as part of their larger uh, transportation project for permitting. Yeah, awesome. So that was another one of the example of how working working with these different organizations is just a really cool win win for these habitat types. Uh, any ideas for attracting the elk? <laughs> I wish we could just, you know, kind of tell them, hey, there's there's open habitat over here. Come on and eat dinner and breakfast and lunch. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't I don't know how to do that. They have been spotted over here. I think the last time was about 20 years ago. So if anybody knows uh, elk ecologists or elk biologists, please um, let me know. I'd love to work something out, but. My understanding is there's little we can do. Uh, so we have a, a comment here. Can you try burning just a few square meters to see what would happen? Um, I won't, but I won't mention it if somebody does. I'm not encouraging that, but uh, not saying anything about it. How about that? I think, think it'd be really cool to see what would happen. Um, another question here, are there any plans for a boardwalk to encourage visitation and still protect the vegetation? Uh, this is a hard one and I don't, there are no plans, first of all, for a boardwalk at this point in time. Um, it's difficult because we do have a very sensitive, although very interesting location here. We want people to get excited about it, especially for getting excitement for these other fens that are being encroached. Upon so I, I understand that the getting getting public involvement is very important, um, but uh, at this point there are no plans and it's good to keep people out of the fen um, as far as like trampling or you know what has happened in the past is illegal vegetation collecting, um, so keeping that down while encouraging visitation very difficult uh, to balance. Um, we have another comment here. Can you tell us about muck pits? Yeah, they're they're really cool. Um, muck pits are basically very deep, unstable um, peat deposition, and you have these areas of peat where it's it's a uh, maybe two three meters across, and there's no vegetation growing on it. There's no litter. There's no nothing. It's just this bare brownish black mucky soil, and they're several meters deep. You do not want to fall into them. Um, I had a friend who was helping me do the, the workout here and uh, they did fall partially into one and went up to their waist and they had one leg out on the stable soil and then the other was all the way in. So definitely be careful. Um, and I think that's all of the questions. There's some really awesome feedback here. I really appreciate that. Uh, and yes, I would love to be in, I would love to be in contact with elk research individuals. That would be really good. Um, any other questions people have? Okay, I think that's that's all that I'm seeing. So thank you, everyone. Um.
for joining me this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. Yes, thank you, Joseph. That was great. You're welcome. We all know a lot more about that special place. And thank you for all the time you've put into it. Let's hope we can keep this going forever. 